Well, at last we're here. The final Hugo game on PS1. It's taken a long time to get this far, but I'm finally ready. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Rob's Retro Reviews, where this time we're finally going to be finishing the Hugo PS1 marathon by taking a look at the last game in the series. I never thought that this marathon would take me this long to complete, but a year and three months later, we're finally ready to wrap it up. So, let's take a look at Hugo the Evil Mirror, which was created and published by ITE Media. As the game boots up, there's all the usual eye dents, but a new one caught my eye because not only was it brand new, but it also was promoting a website dedicated to Hugo. So let's check that out and see what information we can find. Huh. Well, I can't say I expected anything different, to be honest. The next thing we see is a brand new language select screen and main menu, which is paired with some epic music. I get the feeling that they mean business with this game. I'm glad they've finally stopped using the same menu template they've used for the past three games in the series. It makes it seem like they've actually put some effort in this time. There's also difficulty settings, and because at this point I'm basically a pro at the Hugo games, I'm obviously going to go with hard. As far as I'm aware, the only thing this actually affects is how much damage the enemies do to you. But because I'm hardcore, I'm going to do it anyway. As with the other Hugo games, it's at this point that we're treated to an introduction cutscene. So let's take a look at it. Without Hugolina around, my beauty will quickly fade. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on there. We're finally acknowledging this in the sixth game into the series, are we? I picked up on this all the way back in my Hugo 2 review, but to recap, the first Hugo game was all about Scylla kidnapping Hugo's wife so that she could do some sort of spell to make herself more beautiful. The implication being that Scylla's beauty would disappear if she didn't have Hugolina captive. But then in the second game onwards, Scylla is shown to still be in this form, even without having Hugolina as a prisoner. I had just let this go, but now they're actually acknowledging it, so it must be that Scylla can maintain a beautiful form for quite a long time, even without Hugolina. In which case, why doesn't she just kidnap Hugolina and then let her go? Like normally, evil villains have the intention of defeating the protagonist, or to take over the world or something, but Scylla literally just wants to maintain a beautiful form. So why does she keep getting Hugo involved at all? Scylla and Hugo could both live happily and achieve the goals without any real conflict. I mean, it could be that I'm just looking too deeply at a game about a cartoon troll. So let's move on. So, after Don Croco accidentally smashes a tray, Scylla gets an idea to get rid of Hugo forever and heads out to his house in the troll forest. We haven't seen this place in a while. I'm pretty sure the last time we were here was all the way back in the first Hugo game. But anyway, Hugo and his three kids are making some kind of dough and just having a general good time, but then Scylla arrives and breaks into his house. I hope I'm not spoiling a nice family mood, am I? <laughs> you know what? Why didn't Scylla just do this a long time ago? Just bust his front door down and stab him for God's sake. Get it over with, quick and easy. <laughs> Get out of my house, Scylla. You know you're not welcome. I see Hugo's voice hasn't improved. It just sounds like somebody's holding the nose shut while they talk. It's difficult to take a main character seriously when they sound like that. Scylla traps Hugo in the evil mirror and shatters it into three pieces and then sends them flying through the front door using her magic abilities. She then goes to find Hugolina, who is out picking wild berries, leaving the three kids to find the three mirror pieces and save Hugo. To be honest, this is a way better story than some of the other Hugo games, and it's easy to follow and understand, and sets up the main villain and protagonists well. Despite the dodgy voice acting, I think this is one of the better story setups that a Hugo game has ever had. So, with Hugo stuck in the mirror, the playable characters are actually Hugo's kids, who each have their own unique level to go through. You can cycle through them and choose which level to do first, giving the game a bit of a feeling of being non-linear, and if you look off to the side, you'll see that for the first time in the entire series, the game actually keeps track of your collectibles. 
meaning that there's a reason to actually go for 100%. There's also medals for getting a certain time within the level too, which instantly makes this the most replayable Hugo game right off the bat. I have to say, so far this is looking pretty good. We have cutscenes with voice acting, a decent story setup, multiple playable characters, collectibles, and time trials. That's a lot more content than, say, Hugo Frogfighter. Anyway, let's jump into the game properly now by starting with Troller Roots level, which is called Mob Nuts. Each level starts with an introduction cutscene setting up the level's main villain and the general theming of the level too. This one is set in a gangster world where these beavers have found a piece of the mirror and are using it as an ornament. So the game begins and after messing with the controls, I find that you can jump, move, flail your arms around, and... spin? I said that Hugo the Quest for the Sunstones and Black Diamond Fever borrowed heavily from Crash Bandicoot, but now one of the main characters literally has a spin attack. Even the sound effect is similar to Crash's. The game is a 3D platformer which also incorporates 2.5D elements to increase variety. These bags will make gems appear, which are the game's main collectible, and getting around 90% of them in any level will make your maximum health increase. This is a mechanic that was first in Hugo Black Diamond Fever, and it's one that I actually quite like because it's an extra incentive to explore the levels properly, on top of seeing a 100% rating at the end. One of the main areas this game falls completely flat is in the combat. Literally the first enemy I came across was a nuisance to defeat, and that's because he just runs around in a circle as you chase him, but he's slightly faster than you, meaning you have to cut him off but he also changes directions, making it an incredibly frustrating experience. After getting past that, we learned that the weird flail move I mentioned earlier is actually an interact animation used to turn valves and activate switches. I have to say, so far, this game is alright. The music is pretty good and reflects the tone of the game well, the graphics are a little bit dated but still passable, and the game feels alright too. Where it falls down though is when you have to do more accurate or complicated jumps, at which point it just sometimes outright doesn't work. I found myself clipping through the floor and walls, having jump pads literally not respond to me, and having the double jump ability not work half the time. I feel like the reason the other Hugo 3D platformers felt decent is because they kept it really simple. You had a single jump and a single attack, and this made it so they couldn't really get anything too wrong. But here, I think they bit off slightly more than they could chew. I appreciate they tried to make this feel like more of an actual game with more substance, but it's just not pulled off very well. By far though, this is the best level design seen in a Hugo game. You go from traditional 3D platforming, to combat with a variety of enemies, who all have different attacks. Although this isn't really important, seeing as you kill all of them by just standing next to them and spamming the square button. There's also 2.5D platforming sections which have more verticality in the design, and there's parts where you need to flip switches and do timed sections, and areas where boulders will be coming down a hill towards you, and you'll have to avoid them or get pushed into a pit. It's pretty good, and there's quite a bit of variety in this level. I feel like with the other Hugo games I said more about each level, but here there isn't really all that much to say. It's decent, but it's not good. It's passable, but it falls down on the lack of strategy in terms of combat, and the controls feeling very awkward at times. The music also jitters around quite a lot, and sounds terrible in certain areas. Another positive is that the level actually ends with a proper boss fight. You walk into the room from the beginning cutscene and confront the mob boss. You have to turn four valves in each corner of the room to make a chandelier fall onto his head. You do this while avoiding his gunshots, which can be pretty difficult, but after learning you could spin attack him and stun him for quite a long amount of time, it became very easy. But still, it's a good idea for a boss that's fairly unique. There's even a cutscene after you beat the boss, which is a nice reward for doing the level. Well that's the first level done with, and I would say I had a relatively good time with it, but there's still time for them to screw things up. 
So in the second level you control Cholari whose level is called Berserk Vikings and this is a unique level in the game because it's the only one that takes place inside of a vehicle. I think the vehicles are quite a big part of what makes a Hugo game a Hugo game so I'm glad to see them make a bit of a return here. This level is a race where you control a wild pig who is pulling a chariot and the objective is to come first and simply win the race. First off, while the graphics here aren't amazing and there isn't much detail at all, I do have to say that it looks pretty good, especially for a Hugo game. It controls a little bit slippery, but this actually might have been done on purpose because it's set on an icy track, so it's forgivable. I will say though, why did they make all three of Hugo's kids' levels take place in the snow? While each theme is different to each other, the visual design all blends into one because they all look pretty much the same. I think that was quite a big mistake and they should have done a grass, snow and desert level instead, or something to that effect. This level is incredibly basic, only using an accelerate and brake button along with the d-pad, but it was fairly fun to complete and win. The issue is that if you want to get 100% of the gems, you'll have to replay it because I doubt you'll be able to go fast and get every single gem. Which is a bit annoying and weirdly, it's a problem shared with the motorbike levels of Crash Bandicoot 3. A nice attention to detail here is that if you lose the race, there's actually a different cutscene that plays to if you win. Which honestly, I didn't expect at all. After losing, I just expected it to go to the level select menu straight away. Why the total number of gems in each level is so random, I have no idea. Take the second level where I got 100% of the gems, which turned out to be 98 of them. Why not just make it so that there's 100 gems in each level and just make it easy to keep track of? I will say that this level does lack substance. It probably would have been better as a part of a larger level or maybe as a level boss or something, but as it stands, it kind of fails to warrant itself existing as a full-on level to me. The next level goes back to being a standard 3D platformer, but this time you play as Trollarat, whose level is called Roman Beavers. So the main difference between the first level and this one is that you now can't double jump, but instead you have a projectile attack in the form of a snowball cannon, which by no means looks similar to Crash Bandicoot's Fruit Bazooka. The issue with this level is that the main gimmick being the snowball cannon means that if the cannon isn't fun to use or doesn't work very well, it would pretty much ruin the whole thing, right? Well yeah, unfortunately that is the case, and it's disappointing because it ruins what could have been a half decent level. The main issues with it are that the auto lock on is terrible, you can miss enemies stood right in front of your face, enemies have way too much health and you can't jump and shoot at the same time, meaning that you have to aggro an enemy and potentially get hit just so you have the opportunity to hit them. Other than that it just doesn't feel satisfying to use and I would rather have just had the spin attack from the first level. In fact, I think it would have been a much more interesting mechanic to have allowed you to play these levels as any of Hugo's kids, and each of them could have given you an extra advantage. So we already have Trolleroot, who can double jump making basic platforming easier, and Trollerat, who has the snowball cannon, thus making combat easier. They then could have adjusted Trollerit's character to be used in the normal platforming levels, maybe giving him more health than the other characters or something, and then allowed you to choose how you want to play the game. The enemies in this level are much more interesting to fight against than in the first level. Some chase after you, not giving you much time to dispatch them from a distance, some have shields which prevent you from shooting them with projectiles at all, and some throw snowballs at you, meaning that you have to get rid of them with the cannon rather than hitting them up close. On paper this makes the combat problems I had with the first level disappear, but it still doesn't feel all that satisfying to use these different attacks because of the problems I mentioned earlier. Still though, they did try to address some of the issues with the previous games, and I can respect that. You know, something I've not thought about until just now is that this game exists in a universe where Romans, Vikings, and the Mafia all exist within one timeline. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a bit weird looking back on it. The rest of this level basically consists of just going down corridors and entering rooms of enemies, killing them, and then going down yet more corridors. I like how they tried to make each level feel different, but this one just felt boring to me, and it was a bit of a slog to get to the end. This wasn't helped by this section of the level where this wall opens up by using a switch, and then you need to make a bridge appear by using another switch. But then I couldn't jump onto the bridge because the game seemed to think that the wall was still there and didn't let me through. I died and did this section again, and the same thing happened. I managed to force my way through the invisible wall but it felt awkward and I couldn't believe that this was left in the final game when it felt so unfinished. Now get ready for the worst part in the entire game, 
I mean, they couldn't make a Hugo game without at least one pathetically bad section, could they? So you enter the boss room and instead of having an actual fight, you end up having to chase this Emperor Beaver around his garden. But he's slightly faster than you, meaning that like the enemy in the first level, you have to cut him off and attack him before he changes direction. The problem is that this is way harder than the enemy in the first level, and he can survive way more hits too. My thumb literally started to hurt because of how long I had to maintain pressure on the D-pad to keep running after him. Why in God's name anyone thought this was a good idea is beyond me. To give you a sense of how long this took me, here's the full boss fight played at high speed. So that's all three levels done, and the game's completed, right? Well, that's what I thought, but no, we're only just getting started. After finishing the three kids levels, I then discovered that you could press down on the level select menu to find an entirely new set of levels. The reason I didn't know you could do this is because you have to go past an exit to main menu function to get to the new levels. This is really bad UI, and it really should be made more obvious that there's more to the game than just playing as Hugo's kids. But either way, after getting the three mirror pieces back, we now have the ability to play as Hugo, who is still trapped within the mirror. So let's start his first level, which is titled Castle Clocks. All of Hugo's levels take place in this weird castle inside of the evil mirror, and I actually think that that's quite an interesting idea, and adds a sense of mystery to the whole thing because you don't know what to expect. Hugo's ability is his push move, which just lets him push certain obstacles out of the way. It's a rubbish ability, and it's really context sensitive too. You literally only ever need to use it when there's an obvious cage block in the path. He does have the double jump ability too though, so I guess that's a good thing. Other than that, he attacks with a simple punch and controls identically to troll a root from the first level. Hugo seems to have developed some major issues between the last game and this one, because he now has this strange obsession with straight up punching every mirror he comes across. <laughs> But then again, I guess if you look like Hugo, you would want to punch every mirror came across too, so I suppose it makes sense. This level looks fairly interesting with its surreal castle theme, but it doesn't have any standout moments to really talk about. It's just bog-standard platforming mixed with the occasional enemy you punch, and that's it. That's really the problem with this game as a whole. There's nothing unique about it, and it doesn't have enough character to be able to get away with that. It's not even that it's particularly bad, it's just average. Also, why does Hugo sometimes turn into Waluigi? <laughs> Something that only a long-time fan of the Hugo games would appreciate is that sometimes when you let Hugo go into his idle animation, he'll say perhaps his most famous line, and it actually made me quite happy that the thought of including it here. Don't be slow, I'm ready to go. It just isn't as good as back when the original Hugo voice actor did it. I don't know, it just felt like he meant it more. Don't be slow, I'm ready to go! The level ends with a boss fight against a floating Scylla head that shoots lasers at you. This boss is quite pathetic to be honest and just requires you to walk around and smash a particular mirror that's lit up until all of the mirrors have gone. It's ridiculously easy and a bit of a disappointment after going through the whole level just for that. The next level is Rainbow Towers, and it's basically a boulder chase level from Crash Bandicoot, only with the boulder being replaced by Scylla's floating head and it shooting lasers at you. This is by far the hardest level in the game, I think, but for none of the right reasons. You just aren't given enough time to collect everything before the head catches up and starts open firing, and you come up to these switches which you have to stand still and hit, and if Scylla's head is near you, you don't stand a chance of being able to hit the switch without getting hit yourself. 
Also, the actual Scylla's head doesn't actually hurt you, so the only punishment for letting the head catch up with you is that it'll start shooting lasers. It's not like when the boulder catches you in Crash and it's an instant death. So this does get rid of quite a lot of the pressure you feel from the head chasing you once you realise this. I think this level could have done without the switch sections, and the gems should have just been placed on the path rather than only appearing once you've walked into a bag. Sometimes you'll find yourself not knowing where the gems are going to spawn, and then missing them because you don't want the head to catch up with you. It's generally just an annoying level to finish, and it's even more annoying if you're going for 100%. You know what's a bit weird? You'd have thought that there would have been a cutscene showing that the kids had completed the mirror, or a cutscene showing that Hugo was trapped in the mirror world, but there's no cutscenes for any of the Hugo levels despite an intro and completion cutscene for all of the kids' levels. Maybe the last half of the game was rushed? The last level is called Evil Mirror Castle, and like the first of Hugo's levels, there's just not a lot to say about it. There's no interesting gimmicks, and there's just nothing going on of any value. It's just standard platforming with nothing to report on. The boss is yet again just the floating Scylla head, and you basically just do the same thing that was done in the first of Hugo's levels. A part of four mirrors will light up, and you'll need to hit it and move on to the next piece until there's no mirrors left. It's boring, and far too easy. Well, this is it. The last battle against Scylla on the last Hugo game for PS1. I can already taste the freedom. After completing all of Hugo's levels, you'll unlock a brand new extra level, which is titled The Final Battle, and it's the last boss of the game. I have to say, so far in the series, they've not been very good at doing final bosses. In fact, most of the time, there isn't even a final boss. So let's hope this one's better. Yet again, you're fighting Scylla's floating head, and you're basically doing the same thing you did in the previous level's bosses. You just have to hit a mirror that's lit up, and keep doing that until they're all gone. They really could have come up with something a bit better than this, couldn't they? The final boss is supposed to be something a bit different, but it's just the same as the others. There's no climax here, and it's just really, really short. What a disappointing ending. At least we've got one final cutscene, though. So Hugo escapes the mirror with the help of his kids, and they celebrate together before going on to rescue Hugolina. Hugo throws the evil mirror onto Scylla, trapping her inside, and then lets it smash into tiny pieces on the floor. He then rescues Hugolina, and the two enjoy a kiss before running away. I actually thought for a second that Scylla would just be left trapped in the mirror forever, which would have been a pretty dark ending, but we're then shown Don Krakow attempting to put the mirror back together, while being insulted by Scylla from inside the broken shards. I did get 100% completion on the game, and there's no extras or anything that's unlocked by doing so, which is a bit disappointing, but having said that, I didn't get the gold on all of the time trials, purely because I don't understand how it works. On the menu, I assumed that the number on the right of the time trial area was the number of that particular medal you had, but then after completing a time trial, it seemed to just display your best time next to the medal instead. But I got a silver medal, yet my time was shown next to the gold medal? I don't know, it's confusing and I didn't want to waste my time doing all the time trials, only to discover it didn't properly record it. Plus, I'm pretty sure you get absolutely nothing for getting all of the golds anyway. Something I've not mentioned because I actually didn't find out about it until after I had finished the entire game, is that it does actually have memory card saving. You have to press start on the level select screen, and from there you can access the save and load options. It's a bit weird how this isn't made obvious, but I'm glad it's there. And the fact it is there makes this the second Hugo game, out of six, where you can actually properly save your progress, the other one being Hugo too. So that's nice. So that's Hugo the Evil Mirror finished. I would say without a doubt that this is the best one on the PS1, and it's the one out of all of the Hugo platformers that I would recommend the most too. Having said that, if we're talking about the Hugo series as a whole, I would recommend the first game over any of the others, simply because it's bad, but it's also entertaining. At the end of the day, Hugo the Evil Mirror is a below-par platformer that's really only ever going to appeal to fans of Hugo, or fans of platformers that are really scraping the bottom of the barrel. I'm giving Hugo the Evil Mirror a 4 out of 10. I like the idea of having different playable characters, each with their own abilities to make different aspects of the game easier, but I feel like this could have been executed in a much better way. Just look at games like Super Mario Bros. 2 for an example of this. The level design is very hit and miss, going from actually being quite interesting and varied, like in the first level, to being boring, tedious, and uninspired, like in the later levels. 
Generally, the gameplay feels quite varied, having a vehicle level, boulder level, boss fights, and lots of smaller changes, but it tends to stay a bit too safe when it comes to the platform in itself, which is the main part of the game. The story is decent and the graphics are okay by PS1 standards, but the controls can be awful when you're trying to do precise movements or do the time trials. In fact, the time trials do a great job in highlighting the game's flaws in this area, which actually leads me to think I would have preferred them to not be there. I had more fun with this game than any of the previous platforming Hugo games, so if you liked any of the others, maybe give this one a shot too. We've done it! We've finally reviewed every single Hugo game on PS1. If you want to check out any of my old Hugo videos, you can do so by looking at a playlist that I've made specifically for them. Alternatively, you could go to the description of this video where they're all linked. Either way, this kind of marks the end of an era for my channel, because the first video I ever uploaded here was for Hugo 1, and if it wasn't for everybody commenting on that and liking that, I probably wouldn't have continued with this marathon. So thanks to everybody that's interacted with me on these videos, and thanks for watching. As far as more Hugo content goes, I do plan on eventually doing a retrospective video which talks more casually about the Hugo PS1 series as a whole, and I do have plans to cover the PS2 series of Hugo games too, but you'll probably have to wait quite a while for that if I decide to do it at all, because I would rather put my effort into covering other games for now. In the meantime, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person on YouTube to have ever covered the entire Hugo PS1 series, and I've got to say, I'm pretty happy with that. Thanks for watching the review, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, leave a like and a comment below. Let me know which is your favourite Hugo PS1 game, and I'll be back soon with more reviews and other content. So until then, bye!